Dylan Gabriel will be Oregon's quarterback this year as spring football is on a brief hiatus. But just how good is the former Oklahoma Sooner? Here we go. You are Locked On Ducks, your daily podcast on the Oregon Ducks, part of the Locked On Podcast Network, your team every day. Yes, it is that time once again for Locked On Ducks. I'm your host, Spencer McLaughlin. Thank you so much for making this your first listen or your first view of the day. Part of the Lockdown Podcast Network, your team every day, and your number one source to stay up to date with the Ducks. If you have not already, like, comment, subscribe, rate, and review wherever you listen to or watch this show, which today is brought to you by our friends at FanDuel. Make every moment more. New customers join today, and you'll get $200 of bonus bets if your first bet of $5 or more wins. Visit FanDuel.com slash Locked On to get started. Plenty of Oregon hoops talk coming up later in the show. That's not why we bring on Max Chadwick, though, of Pro Football Focus. You know it as PFF. We're going for a little film breakdown here. Max was on the show recently talking about Oregon players going to the draft, but how about Oregon players on the field this year, specifically the signal caller in Dylan Gabriel. Max, give me kind of your big picture overview before we dive into the details about what you make uh, of the Ducks' next quarterback. Well, well, first of all, Spencer, thanks for having me on again. If you want to talk Oregon hoops, man, I'm I'm down to talk and follow Dante, (laughs) dude. He was freaking awesome in that Colorado Pac-12 game, man. So good, so good. Uh, I'm I'm expecting the Ducks to to make some noise, I think, in March Madness. I'm excited for their game against South Carolina. But, yeah, talk about Dylan Gabriel, though. Um, He's my number two quarterback in college football heading into next year. I thought he was the top quarterback in the transfer portal. Um, He was one of the best quarterbacks in America, truly, this past season. I think he had the third best PFF grade. Uh, Yeah, third best PFF grade this past year, only behind Jaden Daniels and Bo Nix, obviously, uh, who were two Heisman finalists. So Dylan Gabriel, I'm a huge, huge fan of. I think he's an excellent college quarterback. Now, will he become a potential first-round pick like Bo Nix? No. Uh, because I think that you know his tools just aren't there for the NFL level. But for Oregon fans, that, that shouldn't really matter too much. I mean, he's going to be a great college quarterback, and I would not be surprised if he's in New York for the Heisman ceremony with the way that offense looks right now. So everydayers out there who listen to or watch this show every day, first of all, I appreciate you all very much. Second of all, you're probably thinking, wow, Spencer, you're having your own thoughts challenged here by a guy who does nothing but watch football film all day because I like – Dylan Gabriel. I won't say I'm enthralled with him. I would have preferred Cam Ward from Washington State. I think Ward has got more untapped potential compared to Dylan Gabriel, but certainly Gabriel is is capable, serviceable, good quarterback, and, and does some really nice things. But I, I don't think he's someone that does end up in New York City, even though he's got the ground game as, as a factor to you know boost his Heisman stats and whatnot, and certainly that'll be you know a feature of the Oregon or a part, not a feature of the Oregon offense, but a part of it and kind of kind of what he does. So, what is it about him that makes you think, yeah, he he's got that Heisman potential? Well, I think honestly, it, first of all, it's him. I, I think he's a very good college quarterback. He's got great touchdown field. Like you said, he, he can run. He's very safe quarterback too. Does not put the ball in harm's way. And the reason why I think he's a better fit for Oregon than say like a guy like Cam Ward, like you just mentioned, Cam Ward is a freaking roller coaster right now, man. That guy, he makes some throws that basically no other quarterback in the country can make, or very few can. And then he also makes a lot of head scratching plays as well. Um, he puts the ball in harm's way a lot. And I think in that Oregon system that asked Bo Nix to kind of just be the point guard of the offense, not take too many risks and just kind of be an efficient assassin. Uh, that kind of fits what Dylan Gabriel has been throughout his entire career. And plus, I mean, not only do I think Dylan Gabriel can make it to New York uh, by himself, but also because I think he's got one of the maybe the best receiver duo in college football uh, in Tez Johnson and Evan Stewart. Now the Texas A&M transfer, also an excellent offensive line, even though they've lost some pieces uh, with a Johnny Cornelius, one of my top offensive tackles returning to college football. Josh Connerly on the left side, I think he's a really, really good left tackle as well. Um, I, I think this Oregon team, and obviously Will Stein's still there to call plays. This is a team that's going to be competing for a national championship next year, in my opinion. And uh, if they do that and Dylan Gabriel puts up the numbers, I think he can. Uh, yeah, I think he can go to New York for the Heisman ceremony. And that's why I think he's a better fit for that offense rather than a guy like Cam Ward. Because, like I said, he's just he kind of fits the Bo Nix mold, mold more than a Cam Ward who's kind of a, a riskier player. In my opinion. Yeah, I mean, my, my thinking with Ward is, you know, Will Stein runs a quarterback-friendly system, and I think yeah. if you can hone him in a little bit that his, his traits are just, you know, so high level. Whereas with Gabriel, you, you have, you know, a, an undersized guy who, who can move, but he's not that fast. He's got a good arm, but not a great arm. And he certainly pushes the ball 
down the field a good amount. And, and that was, you know, the consistent knock on Bo Nix in the Oregon offense last year. Is, you know, it's a lot of dink and dunk RPO based stuff. And obviously it was very effective. They were one of the best offenses in all of college football should be again this year. Gabriel, when you pull up his highlight reel, Max, and I want you to go beyond the highlights, that's of course why we bring you on, and, and go into kind of the, the film study of Dylan Gabriel. Where is he at his best? How proficient is he in that RPO game? And you know how does his, his propensity to want to push the ball down the field mesh with what Will Stein wants to accomplish on offense? Yeah, like I said, I, th- I think he really fits into this offense like a glove, honestly. like I-, I really am excited about the fit for him. I think this is almost a perfect scheme fit for Dylan Gabriel because if you just look at that Oregon offense, and yeah, that was a knock. That's a knock on Bo Nix in the pre-draft process, of course, is that the Oregon offense didn't ask him to do too much compared to other top quarterbacks in this draft where he got an excellent, one of the, maybe the best offensive line in terms of pass protection and protecting him. Uh, really good receiving core. And then also, he, like I said, he's not pushing the ball downfield nearly as much as other players. Uh, Dylan Gabriel, I think, is going to do exactly that again, um, which is why I think he's going to fit so well. And I think he fits that, you know, take what the defense gives you. Take the open receiver. Don't push the ball downfield too much if you if you don't need to do it. Um, that's why I think he fits in the offense more than another a guy like Cam Ward would because Cam Ward will probably look to push the ball downfield when he doesn't need to. Uh, Dylan Gabriel won't do that. I think he's going to play within the offense really well. And like I said, when you have all those returning pieces around him, um, I, I think that's why I think he's going to be such a good fit in that offense. He does have really good touchdown field too. I think that's something I, I've really liked when I watched his tape. And like I said, he does have underrated mobility as well. Uh, but I, I'm just really excited to see him kind of just take that Bo Nix role and, and run with that next year. What do you think is his biggest weakness as a quarterback that that he you know maybe needs to improve upon individually or can be aided by in this Oregon offense, which, as we discussed, has got weapons literally everywhere. Receiver, tight end, running back. You're going to have a good offensive line. Where, where can Dylan Gabriel improve the most? I, I don't know if he can improve this. I, I, again, this is why I think he's one of the best quarterbacks in college football, and he won't be a really top pick in the NFL draft, even though he's one of the best in college football, is because I just don't think he has the tools to really to, to succeed at the NFL level. You need that top-tier arm talent to really be a high draft pick. So he doesn't scream uh, first or second round pick like maybe a guy like Bo Nix does to me. Um, he's more of maybe like a third rounder if he has a great year, maybe a, a day three pick or something like that too. Um, like I said, this, this to me screams great college quarterback, maybe not a guy that you really, you know, put the keys to an offense in, uh, in his hands at the NFL level. So again, I don't think he can really change that about himself. It's kind of who he is. Like I said, he's an undersized guy. Doesn't have a huge, huge arm. He has enough of an arm to push the ball downfield, but not a huge one that you really project to the NFL. Uh, that's kind of the, the weakness with Dylan Gabriel. He also is an older player too. Uh, he's a sixth year senior now. Um, so yeah, he's played a lot of college football. So, and that also is a positive for him because he's, he's seen a lot. Um, he's not going to take too many risks. Um, but when you term, in terms of looking at the NFL draft, that will be probably a negative with him is that he will be a sixth year player and doesn't have great tools for the NFL level either. Yeah. I mean, I guess that's why, you know, I, I don't think he can be what Bo Nix was last year because he he's not as big. He's not as fast. He doesn't have as big of an arm. So I think a couple plays here and there Bo could make that I don't yeah. think Gabriel has in the bag. But when I look at him, is he good enough to help Oregon win a national championship? Yeah, absolutely. I mean, Darren Thomas played a national championship game. That That's kind of what I think of with him. You know, Thomas had a good enough arm. He executed the offense. He was decently mobile. I think that's a pretty good comparison. I've heard people bring up Vernon Adams or Jeremiah Masoli as well. Like, those guys had Oregon playing at a high level and weren't Heisman contenders. So, that you know, I'm not down on Oregon's offense with Gabriel there with him in charge. But do you think that that's a better comparison than a Herbert, a Mariota, or a Bo Nix? Yeah, he doesn't have the – he's not an NFL quarterback like, the, like those three were. He doesn't have the tools that those three have. And, yeah, I do think there's – obviously there's going to be a drop-off when you lose a guy like Bo Nix who's been excellent for two years at Oregon, now will potentially be a first-round pick in the NFL. You're expecting a drop-off. But, honestly, with a guy like Dylan Gabriel and, and in terms of the system that they run – I'm not expecting too big of a drop off, honestly, because I, I do think Dylan Gabriel, again, does he have the potential that a Bo Nix does? No, but I do think he's going to fit that offense and what, exactly what they did this past these past two years and what Bo Nix did. I think Dylan Gabriel is able to do that. Whereas a guy like Bo Nix, you know, you can argue could have done more than what the Oregon system allowed him to do. Dylan Gabriel, I probably wouldn't argue that, but I think he fits the offense. And that doesn't really matter when you, you can play in that offense anyway. So, um, yeah, I, I still think Dylan Gabriel, like I said, I, I was really happy with the scheme fit for him. Um, and he's been kind of a guy that's played in kind of like a college offense before, uh, working, you know, with guys like Jeff Levy at Oklahoma, even a little bit at UCF too. 
Um, he kind of played in those kind of offenses before, and I think the Oregon one will, will also help him in that respect too. So, yeah, I'm expecting – Big, big thanks from Dylan Gabriel next year. Max Chadwick, PFF. Fantastic stuff, Max. Thanks so much for stopping by. Of course, Ben. Thanks for having me. Before we get to that, today's episode of Locked on Ducks is brought to you by Nissan. This week's March Madness Bracket Highlight is brought to you by our friends at Nissan. Each week, we're picking one team that stands out, a team that pu- that pushed it further than the rest, just like any of the all-new 2024 Nissan SUVs. These guys were able to take it to the next level. The Yukon Huskies are the Nissan Armada. The top-seeded team is as hardcore as it gets out there, so no wonder they're the top overall seed in the NCAA tournament. The Auburn Tigers are the Nissan Pathfinder. They've been thrilling to watch and have really really created a lane for themselves after claiming the top spot in the SEC, and they knocked off the Florida Gators in the SEC Tournament Championship, they could be set to make a run in the NCAA Tournament. And I uh, I do think, I do think that Auburn's going to beat UConn. I'm just saying, I'm just saying, and who else would be the Nissan Rogue than the Oregon Ducks? The team absolutely surprised us all with a powerful performance in the final Pac-12 Tournament, punching their ticket to the big dance. They say, win life, go rogue, and that's exactly what the Ducks have done here. And we're going to talk about that on the show. Take the Nissan Rogue, Nissan Pathfinder, or Nissan Armada and go find your next big adventure. Shop at NissanUSA.com. This episode also brought to you by Amazon Fire TV, your destination for sports. From live games to highlights to in-depth analysis, Fire TV offers amazing viewing experiences with smart TVs as well as the Fire TV stick that you can plug into your existing TV that provides access to millions of movies and TV episodes as well as free and live TV. Whether it's opening weekend for baseball or the college basketball tournament, you're going to want to have a Fire TV. Full stop. Fire TV recently created Fire TV channels to deliver a constant supply of the latest videos from your favorite sports brands all for free, which includes all of us here at Locked On, the big pro leagues, college conferences, Fire TV channels let you dive into the game analysis, highlights, and more to keep up to date on everything in the world of sports. Not to mention great news, entertainment, gaming, travel, and cooking videos as well. Check out Fire TV channels on Fire TV and Alexa devices. If you haven't checked out Fire TV channels, you should. To learn more, visit www.amazon.com slash Locked On Fire TV. Alrighty, let's hop back into the mailbag, shall we? Great stuff from Max as always. That guy always delivers. Just like you can deliver questions to the mailbag, YouTube comments or X formerly known as Twitter at S McLaughlin CFB or at Locked on Ducks. Those be the handles. DMs and mentions are wide open. If you want to join the flock over at Subtext and get priority access, talk with me one-on-one and all sorts of other perks, you can join in the description below. There is a link wherever you're listening to or watching this show. Bud asked this yesterday and wanted to expand upon it. Pulling out your crystal ball, do you anticipate attending or going or attending slash doing play by play at the Texas Tech Oregon football game in 2033? A chance to opine about the absurdity of football scheduling. Given the rather beneficial football rule changes we saw this year, what would be your suggestions for rule changes in the future? So I'd mentioned the rule change thing yesterday. Targeting needs to be the next rule that sees an adjustment uh, in, in college football because it's ridiculous that we throw kids out of games in college, but not in the pro ranks. But on the scheduling front, I, I've thought about this several times because college football scheduling is indeed completely backwards. And the the flexibility that Oregon put on display for this year's football schedule demonstrates why everything else is so patently absurd. Because there's this ingrained notion or belief that football games have to be scheduled many years in advance. And you have to have a lot of time to do all this sort of stuff. And then if you really wanted to do it, you could make it happen just like that. Because Oregon State and Oregon weren't going to play the Civil War this year, and then they did. And Texas Tech moved their game to go play Washington State. And the Hawaii game got canceled. I know some Duck fans were disappointed with that, but such is the way of life. So I I think that for scheduling, Oregon should approach it from a standpoint playing in the Big Ten of having some quality non-conference opponents. But if you're trying to ensure the best access possible to the playoff, Oregon is not going to need some big time non-conference games that they could lose. Like they, they, they just won't. Now, as a traditionalist college football fan myself, I would like to see Oregon playing big time games like Ohio State in 2021 or Georgia in 2022. And I thought Texas Tech last year was really fun and was a rather important game. But going forward in this dumb world of realignment, I, I think that you can 
pretty easily justify Oregon setting up a non-conference schedule where Oregon State is the best team you play. Because in the Big Ten, you've got all the credibility. You're going to have the automatic bids because now it'll be a 14-team playoff and the Big Ten and the SEC are going to dominate those berths. You don't need to build credibility with your resume. Oregon every year is going to play Washington, who we know will be good. Oregon every year will probably play at least one of Michigan and Ohio State. They play both this year. If you win those games, not all of them, but just more than you lose, and you're 10 and 2, 11 and 1 every year, that's an automatic burst to the playoff in the Big Ten. And so to say that you need to have some big time, high quality non conference win, I don't think applies. And by the way, I think for Oregon State, they have the chance to be a quality win, not some, you know, top tier or what you would describe in college basketball terms as a quad one victory, but certainly they can be in the quad two department. Like having a good win against a team that is playing mostly Mountain West teams, but also several power four teams, that has the potential to be a top 25 win when the game gets played or perhaps later in the season as it progresses. And that could be the case this year for Oregon State. It could be the case in years to come for the Beavs. So I think having that game as your premier non-conference and you have an FCS opponent, you know, to, you know, as a tune-up in week one, the way they're doing with Idaho this year, a game that I'm planning to be at, by the way, the season opener at Autzen Stadium, I'm 100% planning to be there. And uh, I hope that that all works out because that'd be really fun. And I love seeing you all in person. So I, I think having one FCS game and then a group of five team that you're also probably going to be allow those to su- serve as tune up games for Oregon State, play them the last week of the non-conference the way, you know, kind of that uh, Iowa and Iowa State have done for a long time and then just play your Big Ten schedule. I think that's more than enough for for the Ducks because the Big Ten is just going to have inherent credibility. And whether or not it's deserved, I, I think for in large part it's going to be, right? If you, especially if this if this year's Oregon schedule had USC instead of UCLA, it, it'd be one of the hardest schedules in all of college football. I mean, uh, but, you know, that's a, that's a flip because Oregon played USC last year. So, you know, you'll have a revolving door of, you know, the Penn States and the Wisconsins and Ohio State, Michigan, Washington will always be there. Oregon State will always be there. I, I think for Oregon scheduling wise, if you have the opportunity, just schedule games that you know you're going to win. That's what Michigan has done for the last several years. They've been to the playoff three times and then and won the national championship. So Clearly, especially in the revamp Big Ten with the four West Coast former Pac-12 schools, RIP, then that then that's going to be uh, more than sufficient. So let's get to some basketball talk here because there are a number of things to get to. First things first, first order of business with with no financial component. I am curious what the interest would be in forming an Oregon Locked On Ducks bracket group. I'd be happy to organize it through ESPN. Again, just for funsies. But if you're interested, send me a message. Drop a YouTube comment. But really send me a message on X formerly known as Twitter at S. McLaughlin CFB. And if we can get at least 10 people in there, yeah, sure, that'd be fun. I, I'd be down. Some One of you asked me about that. Uh, and I said, you know what? I think that's kind of a fun idea. So thought I'd throw it out there on the show. I know there are thousands of you that listen or watch, and I'm very grateful for that. And if you want to be a part of it, heck, I'll grow it as large as we want. We can see uh, whose bracket emerges victorious there. Again, nothing on the line. Maybe if you win the bracket group, I can offer you, you know, like a shout out on, on the show or something. There's only so much that I can offer in this particular position, but I think that'd be fun. So if you're interested, let me know and we can absolutely put that together. But a couple of questions that came in about Oregon as they get ready for South Carolina, including one about injuries. And boy, I tell you, I kind of think that the national media not knowing anything about Oregon, or at least not as much as they should, is kind of great. I I think it's kind of great. And Dana Altman showed us why after they won the Pac-12 tournament. We'll get to that after we get to FanDuel, of course. You can say goodbye to Busted Brackets because FanDuel lets you bet on every game of the tournament. Whether you're betting on a big upset or a one seed or Oregon to beat South Carolina in round one and make it all the way to the final four, whatever you want to do, 
It's time to go dancing on America's number one sports book. Right now, new customers get $200 in bonus bets. If your first $5 bet wins, that's 200 bucks to use on point spreads, money lines. You can even pick who's going to win it all. I'm not picking UConn. They're a great team. I'm not picking UConn. I'm not about it because I no one's gone back-to-back since Florida in 06, 07. I don't think that's changing here. I really don't. But if you think it is, by all means, you can go bet it all over at FanDuel. Just visit FanDuel.com slash locked on and bet on college hoops until they cut down the nets. Hopefully it's Oregon. FanDuel.com slash locked on. FanDuel, America's number one sports book and our official sports book here at the Locked On Network. Okay, fun questions here. So uh, Dana Altman went what I would describe as Dana Altman scorched earth after winning the Pac-12 tournament. He goes up to the mic. This video is just hilarious. You got to find it on YouTube. And and if you can't find it, send me a message and I'll I'll send you the clip. Dana Altman is is up there talking with Anfali Dante after they win the tournament. And he's he's looking at three Pac-12 network. You know, it's Ashley Adamson and two other guys whose names are eluding me right now. And and he says, well, all you guys, you know, you, you, you picked against us, right? And one guy was trying to save his bacon, like, no, I, I didn't. And Dana goes, no, I, I watched you. I watched you pick against us. I, I, I remember telling N. Folly, they all, you know, the three guys picked against, picked against us. And N. Folly said, oh, those clowns picked against. Oh, I'm just kidding. He was not kidding. Like the clip is amazing, and I, I have not seen Dana Altman as, as happy as he is right now. And look, you know, that can change, of course, if Oregon loses to South Carolina on Thursday. And on tomorrow's show, uh, I'll I'll have a crossover with Andrew Lyon of Locked On South Carolina, get you everything you need to know for that matchup, which takes place on a Thursday afternoon. But I thought that that, <laughs> that sequence was so good. So, so Clark Kellogg, who has done a phenomenal job over the years. I love Clark Kellogg. He's been in NBA 2K, which I played back when it was a respectable game. He's been on March Madness, you know, TV panels and whatnot. Uh, he said about the Ducks on the selection show, it's hard. I, I'm going to preface this by saying it is hard, even when you write stuff down, to have that much information that you have to deal with. But Clark Kellogg said the words, Oregon is finally healthy. <laughs> like, um, if by finally healthy, you mean no one who played in the Pac-12 tournament has gotten injured yet. Okay, sure. But you can't ever describe this Oregon team as healthy this season. Dante missed two months. Biddle's barely played. Mookie Cook basically hasn't made his collegiate debut aside from one fast break dunk against Washington. I know nothing about Mookie Cook as a college basketball player. I should, but I don't because he was hurt all season. Keyshawn Barthelemy, I don't think he comes back to play in the tournament. I know that Nate Biddle will not because he you know, got sick, lost a bunch of weight and such so hopefully Biddle's back next year and could get a medical red shirt because I think Biddle's a fantastic player and somebody's gonna have to replace Dante but Dante's still here for now of course so um you know a question came in from the flock over at subtext you know maybe for the mailbag how do you see the team injury history affecting us this week well according according to Clark Kellogg we're all healthy but again this and then something I tweeted out when ESPN had what appears to be an AI generated summary of, you know, Oregon season on uh, on the bracket when you click on a preview and just kind of get an understanding of what's going on with this team. ESPN thought for a brief moment in time before it got corrected. Maybe it's because of the pressure applied by Locked On Ducks. I don't know. I don't know. I'm just suggesting. I'm just saying pressure was applied and then an adjustment was made. You be the judge. That'd be a post hoc ergo proctor hoc fallacy, of course. But they said Will Richardson was uh, going to be an important piece. And I was like, that's interesting. Um, Because Will Richardson doesn't play for this team. Hmm, Curious. They also said Oregon had 19 wins. Incorrect. They have 22. So, I think it's 22. Hmm, I don't even know the answer to that question. Uh, But they they definitely, uh, 23. Sorry, 23. So, 
Yeah, I, I, I think that for, see how quick and easy that was to get that right? I did that in less than two seconds and ESPN couldn't take the time. But maybe as we apparently saw in the Pac-12 tournament, that all serves to motivate Oregon and, you know, put a chip on their shoulder and everything like that. So maybe I'm here for it. Maybe I'm here for all these factors coming into play that, you know, could very easily be relayed from a coaching staff to a team to, to give them that edge because sometimes that's what it can come down to. So the early betting lines are kind of crazy. James Crepia, the Oregonian, tweeted this out that, uh, I'm pretty sure it was Crepia, he tweeted out that the Oregon-South Carolina game is one of the few matchups in the NCAA tournament where both teams are favored depending on which sports book you look at. So going, you know, from from FanDuel over to MGM or like all, all, all these other sports books and whatnot. And I actually hadn't checked the uh the FanDuel line, so I I indeed shall uh shall do so here. Oregon against South Carolina is currently South Carolina minus one and a half. But if you look in some other places, it's Oregon minus one or Oregon minus one and a half. So uh, it, it should be a very tight competitive game. Oregon was an 11 and a half point underdog against uh, against Arizona, three and a half point favorite against UCLA, two and a half point dog against Colorado. So this is the third straight game that at least in some capacity, Oregon will be an underdog. They're two and zero in their last couple. So obviously they have to keep that going because it's one and done in the NCAA tournament. But um, yeah, it should be a really, really good game uh, back in Pittsburgh. So, you know, South Carolina doesn't have to travel quite as far. You'd think if there were a fan advantage, it would certainly belong to the Gamecocks in this game. But uh, I, I think Oregon is more than capable of winning not not just one game. I think they can win a couple. I don't know if they can get past the Sweet 16. That might be matchup dependent, but everything can be matchup dependent. So, um, I, I think Oregon is in a good spot. And as I talked about in yesterday's show, I, I like where they are in terms of the quadrant of the bracket they're in because Tennessee, I don't trust in the NCAA tournament. Purdue, I never trust. Though off losing to a 16 seed, maybe they pull a 2019 Virginia and go win the whole thing. They could. Uh, Kansas is not healthy. They're the four. Creighton's the three. Creighton's dangerous. That was an elite eight team last year. Creighton's a good basketball team. And that's who Oregon would face in the second round. But got to get through the Gamecocks first. And we'll talk about that uh, in depth. So you know everything that you need to know about the South Carolina matchup uh, after after tomorrow's show going into Thursday. But a couple more questions here. Uh, I'll start with one from Bud. We hear a lot about Oregon's investment and success in NIL for football. How are we doing with NIL and basketball and other sports? Is our current lack of success in both basketball programs possibly connected to NIL problems? Well, this question came in before Oregon won the Pac-12 tournament, but the point does stand. The NIL collective, remember, is separate from the university. Division Street is not affiliated with the University of Oregon, so they can put their money wherever they feel like it. I don't know if the women's basketball investment is fully there and you've seen some key players transfer out. So on the NIL front, that could certainly be a factor there. I think for the men's team, you know, what my understanding of it is there, I I don't have detailed or public records of this, but my understanding is it is solid, not great, not at the level of football spending and commitment from division street, but it is solid. And, And I think that, you know, you have to have this as a part of recruiting going forward. You have to be willing to to give some NIL money to Jackson Shellstad and KJ Evans and any transfers you might bring in. Uh, the Stoyakovich kid from Stanford's in the portal. Watch for that, by the way. Oregon was after him, chose Stanford. He's the son of NBA legend Peja Stoyakovich, who I remember watching growing up. And that makes me feel old, which I am at some level. But um, I, I think that's you know just a name to watch. But that, again, more of a postseason question there. Um, I, I think Oregon is fine, but I, I don't get the sense that it's you know outrageously over the top good. So certainly more could be better, but I don't think it's a hindrance for, for Oregon's recruiting. I mean, look at the way they just recruited, right? We don't know what Mookie Cook is, but I know that KJ Evans and Jackson Shellstad are studs. A- a- absolute studs. So um, certainly that that can't be, you know, such a negative that, you know, you can't get guys like that because they've gotten guys like that. Uh, and I think will going forward. So last one here, this from Bryman or Bremen, probably Bryman. Vitally important question, Spencer. Every year that the Ducks make March Madness, I pick them 
to go all the way in my bracket and give it a Ducks related name? Should my bracket this year be called Dante's Inferno or the Infallible Dante? That's a tough one. I I like Dante's Inferno. I mean, that guy is is hotter than donut grease from the floor. And no, he doesn't shoot jumpers. It's all layups and dunks and post moves. But guess what? Most guys don't go 12 for 10. He could have gone 9 for 12, and we'd be talking about what a great game he had. And if he'd gone 9 for 12, Oregon might not win the game, which is crazy. But he has been exceptional, and certainly I've loved the way that they've used him at both ends of the floor and allowed him to thrive. But uh, good question there. I, I would go with Dante's Inferno on that one. Appreciate everyone listening. I'll see you next time. Have a wonderful rest of your day, and go Ducks.